in a week pack full of testing at Starbase, Ship 38 is sent to the Massey Outpost, and Ship 37 is relocated to the launch site for static fire testing. How will the first ever static fire of a ship on an orbital launch mount do? Will the modified infrastructure hold up? Will there be any complications with the ship itself? Well, let's dig into this week's update and find out. Starting off this week with a brief fabrication update, on Thursday afternoon, the hot staging adapter for Flight 10 was moved out of Star Factory and over to Mega Bay 1 for installation on top of Booster 16. With Block 2 Starship construction winding down now, multiple Block 3 nose cones were visible through the Star Factory windows this week in various stages of construction. Moving on to the construction at the launch complex, on Friday a section of deluge piping was spotted being driven away from the site. A new vertical tank was also brought to the launch complex on Saturday through the D3 gate. In short order, the tank was offloaded and moved into the new position in the tank farm. Moving up the road to the build site, we could see that the excavators were working to expose the tops of the newly poured piles for the new Gigabay. A few days later, equipment arrived that will be used to cleanly cut the tops of these piles at the desired elevation in preparation for the pile caps that will be added. On Tuesday and Wednesday, a crane was spotted lifting prefabricated panels for installation on the under construction work stand in the front right corner of Mega Bay 2. Also on Tuesday, another fabrication jig that was constructed at the Sanchez site was brought through the ring yard and taken into Star Factory for installation. Moving on to rollout and testing updates, on Saturday, the ship cryo-proofing stand was brought to the ring yard and eventually taken into Mega Bay 2. Overnight, Ship 38 was rolled out of the building on the same stand and taken up the highway to the Massey Outpost for its initial cryogenic proof testing. Starting in the early hours of Monday morning and continuing on into Tuesday, SpaceX performed several tests with Ship 38's payload bay door. The door was open and closed multiple times with workers in the lifts going up and performing inspections and possibly other work in between. On Wednesday, the tank farm at the outpost was spooled up and cryogenics loaded into the final Block 2 Starship. Throughout the day, the ship underwent multiple rounds of testing with its tanks being filled and detanked. This testing also marked the first round of cryo testing at the site since the untimely demise of Ship 36. Late on Thursday night, with the initial round of testing completed now, Ship 38 was rolled back onto Highway 4 and returned to the build site. It seems quite possible that SpaceX may work quickly to install engines on Ship 38 and put it through its static fire campaign prior to Flight 10 in order to avoid having to uninstall and reinstall the ship adapter on the launch mount. Ship 37 also had a busy week, with the ship transport stand arriving outside of Mega Bay 2 late on Sunday. One of the building's bridge cranes was prepared for the lift, and the stand moved inside overnight. By early Monday morning, the Flight 10 Starship was lowered onto the transport stand, and crews got to work securing it in place. A few hours later, the rocket was rolled out of the building and eventually out onto the highway to begin its first journey to the launch complex. By noon, the ship was parked at the base of the Pad A launch and catch tower, and Mechazilla's arms began moving in for a squeeze. By mid-afternoon, the arms were secured to the lift and stabilization points. Ship 37 was then raised up off its transport stand and carefully transferred onto the newly repurposed transport stand turned static fire adapter on the launch mount. Early on Wednesday, the work platform was lowered from the mount as SpaceX shifted towards final preparations for testing. A few hours later, the chopsticks were raised up the tower and the quick disconnect arm swung back in as the tower was transitioned into launch configuration. And shortly before noon, SpaceX performed igniter testing on the ship. About an hour and a half later, a test of the detonation suppression system was observed, followed shortly thereafter by venting from the launch mount as SpaceX continued to move through their pre-static fire procedures. By 3 that afternoon, the vent was closed and propellant loading began. As the cryogenic fluids flowed into Ship 37, SpaceX performed some flap actuation tests. But not too long after, however, a depressed vent was observed and SpaceX began detanking the vehicle after an apparent abort was triggered during the testing. Following the abort, the tower was returned to its standby configuration with the arms dropping back down and closing around the ship. 
That evening, the work platform was returned and raised up under the mount to allow workers access to the underside of the ship. By the early hours of Thursday morning, the work was completed and the platform once again lowered and taken away for storage. As the sun rose over Starbase, the tower was once again transitioned into launch configuration ahead of the day's planned testing operations. Shortly after 8 that morning, we saw another test of the detonation suppression system. Then early that afternoon, the mount once again began to vent as SpaceX worked to cool down the infrastructure. As propellant was loaded into the rocket for the second time in as many days, Ship 37 waved at us once more as it performed another round of flap testing. Then shortly after 2 that afternoon, Ship 37 performed a single-engine static fire. This marks the first ship static fire ever on an orbital launch mount and a significant success for SpaceX as they've worked around the delays caused by Ship 36's rapid unscheduled disassembly at the Massey outpost. Following the test, the ship was detanked as SpaceX got to work pouring over the data in preparation for a full static fire. The next morning started off much the same. The work platform was moved away followed by another test of the detonation suppression system. By mid-afternoon, the mount started venting as stage zero was cooled down. A little over a half an hour later, the vent was closed and propellant began flowing into Ship 37. And once again, we saw flap actuation testing during prop load. Then just after 4.30, Ship 37 lit all six of its Raptor 2 engines for the first time. The Flight 10 Starship performed a seemingly nominal full-duration static fire of all its engines, proving itself launch-capable. With the testing finished now, the ship was detanked and the tower returned to its standby configuration. Switching over to our Falcon 9 updates, Booster 1090 returned from its sixth mission, the O3B, M Power 9 and 10 launch, and was moved to the dock and processed before returning to Roberts Road. The Starlink Group 10-26 mission launched from Space Launch Complex 40 on Saturday morning. Booster 1078 and the recovered fairing halves were both successfully returned to port and processed on SpaceX's Port Canaveral dock. And late on Tuesday, the Starlink Group 10-29 mission lifted off from Space Launch Complex 40, carrying another 28 satellites to low Earth orbit. The booster and fairing halves were all recovered successfully. On Sunday, Booster 1094 was rolled out to the pad and raised to vertical at Historic Launch Complex 39A as SpaceX prepared for the launch of NASA's Crew-11 mission. The next morning, NASA astronauts Zena Cardman and Mike Fink, JAXA's Kima Yui, and Roscosmos's Oleg Platonov arrived at the Cape from Houston as launch preparations moved towards their final phase. Preparations continued on Tuesday with the pre-launch static fire of Booster 1094, proving that the flight-proven rocket was ready to go. The planned launch of the mission was scrubbed on Thursday due to weather with another attempt slated for Friday. Thanks to the pre-launch conference, we learned that the cargo resupply mission planned for later this month will include a first-ever demonstration of a reboost of the International Space Station by a Dragon capsule. Other resupply missions from Northrop Grumman and JAXA will follow later this fall. This launch will also feature the final landing of a Falcon 9 first stage at SpaceX's Landing Zone 1 as work begins to transition Launch Complex 13 for use by both Via Space and Phantom Space. Around lunchtime on Friday, Falcon 9 Booster 1094 blasted off from Launch Complex 39A with Dragon Capsule Endeavor and its four-person crew, sending them on their way to low Earth orbit and a rendezvous with the International Space Station. In other space news, on Friday, Axiom Space announced that the final weld for their payload, power, and thermal module for their Axiom Space Station was completed, moving the new hardware one step closer to being shipped to Houston for integration. NASA announced that they had completed testing on the liquid hydrogen tanks at Launch Complex 39B, including the new 1.25 million gallon tank, the largest in the world. This testing completed the eight planned verification and validation tests on the ground systems checklist for Artemis II. NASA also shared photos of the Artemis III boat tail and engine section in the vehicle assembly building. The arrival of these two sections marks the beginning of the Artemis III assembly process, while the Artemis II rocket is still being put together at the same time. Also on Friday, United Launch Alliance announced that they had completed payload integration with their Vulcan rocket for the upcoming USSF-106 mission, the first national security launch for the company's newest rocket. 
ULA CEO Tori Bruno also shared photos this week of the progress of their Space Launch Complex 3 infrastructure at Vandenberg Space Force Base. Now more than three quarters complete, ULA expects to certify the site by the end of the year, which would enable them to begin launching their Vulcan rocket from the West Coast. Blue Origin CEO Dave Limp shared new footage of the testing of New Glenn's forward module as the company prepares for the second flight of the rocket. In the test, we can see actuation of the flaps as well as firing of the hydrogen peroxide fueled reaction control system. These will both be utilized to stabilize and reorient the first stage for re-entry and landing. He also shared that their Lunar Permanence team is making good progress on their zero boil-off technology. Using prototype hardware, they're now able to hold the conditions necessary for the stable storage of liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. Northrop Grumman announced that they'd taken delivery of the pressurized cargo module for the next resupply mission to the International Space Station. Of note, the module is a new stretched variant capable of carrying an additional 1,300 kilograms of cargo. Firefly Aerospace announced this week that they had been awarded another commercial lunar payload service contract by NASA. This will be the company's fourth lunar mission and will deliver two rovers and three scientific instruments to the moon's south pole. Stoke Space shared a photo of the progress of their build-out of Cape Canaveral's Launch Complex 14. This pad has a long and storied history, including most notably the 1962 launch of the Mercury Atlas 6 mission, which made John Glenn the first American to orbit the Earth. Following many delays in recent weeks, the inaugural launch of Gilmore Space Ares 1 rocket finally occurred on Tuesday. Unfortunately, the rocket experienced an anomaly shortly after liftoff, causing the vehicle to fall back to Earth. Whether by design or luck, the rocket drifted laterally as if it lost lift, meaning that while it did impact at the launch complex, it did not hit the actual pad, hopefully minimizing damage to the infrastructure. Following the failure, the company posted an update touting the milestones they achieved with the first launch of an Australian orbital class rocket from Australia, while their CEO chimed in with an optimistic outlook. And there you have it, another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update brought to you by Lab Padre. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already, guys, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Lab Padre out.